to care for, nurture and protect our children is hardwired into our being. It is a natural extension of what it means to be human. It makes us human. And for some, this basic need has been denied. For some, the chance of fulfilling a basic need was all but a dream. When a young couple decides to marry and start a family, the expectation in most cultures is that the family will grow in all aspects. Addition of children to a marriage changes everything and alters all aspects of life for that family. However, when the couple is unable to add offspring to their family as a result of infertility, a lot of stress often creeps in to a point where the marriage is threatened. Infertility can and has destroyed marriages. But why should that be? What causes infertility? Does the fault lie only with the female or could there be something wrong with the male? Well, stay tuned because these are the issues we tackle in today's show. We focus on infertility. Our expert guests will help us understand the causes, prevention and treatment options available for infertility. So sit back, relax and learn from the show ahead. I'm Dr. Salama Daoum and this is Health Talk. Infertility is a major problem affecting a significant proportion of humanity. According to the World Health Organization, one in every four couples in developing countries suffers from primary or secondary infertility. Infertility in Africa is caused by infections in over 85% of women compared to 33% worldwide, which emphasizes the importance of prevention programs in Africa. How much is known about infertility and what services are rendered to those couples struggling with infertility? We render all the services in the f uh, field of fertility and infertility treatment. Um, I prefer to refer to fertility and not infertility so that you see it in a positive way and not in a negative way. So how do experts approach this problem and how important are lifestyle issues in causing infertility? Everything is available. Uh, from uh, just psychological help uh, to just uh, support uh, to just monitoring a cycle where people will have normal intercourse but you monitor the mucus, the acidity in the body, their diet, their lifestyle, uh, those type of things. A lot has to do with lifestyle uh, and a lot has to do with background knowledge. There are patients that come in and see me that don't even know there's a difference between a fallopian tube and an ovary. So there's a huge uh, part of our treatment which is educational, that you just have to educate people how it works, what's going on. And then when you start monitoring the cycle, they tell you they have a cycle of 36 days. And uh, you think, okay, 36 halfway is they will ovulate on day 16, 17, 18 but then you realize they actually ovulate day 11 or the other way around there are ladies that come in and say to you they produce the mucus pluck as they call it uh, they see the watery mucus discharge from the vagina and they certain they ovulate day 9 but when you monitor the cycle they only ovulate day 18, day 20, 21 I had one lady that ovulated day 28 and then they're pregnant. So for us, sometimes the starting point is just to monitor the cycle and to see where we are and when they actually ovulate so that they can have their intercourse at the correct time. But uh, the background lifestyle and what people eat and that food uh, and, and uh, processed food and sugar and stress and hormone release that causes acidity in the body is very negative for us for fertility. It affects the mucus and sometimes you get that everything is perfectly okay and, and correct but the acidity in the mucus in the uh, uterus will kill the sperm. So a lot has to do with lifestyle. Uh, uh -oh. Anything that can make the body acidic like coffee, alcohol, um, uh, any form of sugar, hidden sugar, any form of starch, carbs, those are the, the negatives for us. Alright, so what are the requirements for normal fertility? How much do we know about fertility? or infertility for that matter. To help us with this is, let's welcome our special guest. First up is Dr. Jack Biko. Dr. Biko is a gynecologist and reproductive medicine specialist based at Steve Biko Academic Hospital in Pretoria. Welcome to Health Talk, uh, Dr. Biko. Thanks for having me here. 
All right. But next up, we have Kathleen Rujda Smith. Uh, Kathleen is a representative of an organization called IFASA, Infertility Awareness Association of South Africa. Welcome to Health Talk, Kathleen. Thank you very much for having us. I'm going to come back to you, but let's start with Dr. Biko. Dr. Biko, we, we're talking obviously about infertility, but perhaps let's start with the basics. Clearly, you know, contrary to what small children believe, babies just don't get dropped from the sky or down the chimney or whatever, you know. Um, there's stuff that needs to happen before a baby is born. Please take us through what happens normally. Well, under normal circumstances, uh, spermatozoa, sperms are produced by the male, by the man, and then these have to travel through his pipes and then they're ejaculated into the vagina. And then a lot of sperms will fall out of the vagina, but the majority should go through into the womb. And then they go into the fallopian tubes where they will meet the egg, which is produced from the woman's ovary. Mm. And then the embryo, the baby, is actually made in the fallopian tubes. Then the baby's got about five days to traverse fallopian tubes, to enter into the womb and to implant into the womb. Right. Once it's in the womb, it's got about nine months to complete the whole cycle. All right. Of course, you make it sound very simple, but let's talk about <coughs> the, 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 f the, maybe let's start with the sperm first. So we assume that the sperm has to be normal. Yeah. And, and, and how do we know that it's normal? What, what makes it normal? Well, the production of sperms is determined by the brain, really. The brain produces certain hormones called yeah. FSH yeah. that stimulates the testicles yeah. to produce sperms. Okay. So if there's a problem in the brain, then there'll be no sperms. Okay. And if there's a problem within the testicles, then be, there's going to be no response to the stimulation from the brain, then there's going to be no sperms as well. All right. Sometimes the brain is fine, the testicles is fine, but the pipes that carry the sperms from the testicles yeah. to the penis are blocked or damaged. Okay. And in that case, we'll also have a problem from a male aspect okay. causing infertility. Okay. That sounds simpler on the male side. So in the female... The egg has to be produced. When does it get produced? Well, the, you should understand that uh, the ovaries produce eggs all the time. Yeah. In fact, our eggs are being produced from before the child is born. From what's in the uterus, you already produce eggs every month. Whether you see your periods, whether you don't see them, whether you're pregnant or not, you are actually producing eggs that are just not growing. But in general, eggs every month will produce one egg. It grows to the right size. Once that si egg has reached the right size, it can then be fertilized. Immature eggs cannot be fertilized. Okay. So the eggs have to reach a particular size to be released from the ovary into the fallopian tube where they can be fertilized by the sperm. All right, okay. And then, of course, the tubes have to be normal and the, and the, the, the okay. womb has to be normal as well. Okay. Now, so what then is infertility? Well, infertility, really speak, is, is the inability of a couple to conceive within 12 months of regular, unprotected intercourse. Mm -hmm. So if a couple has been together for a year or so, and they have regular, unprotected intercourse, and there is no conception after 12 months, mm -hmm. there is a problem. That couple must consult. Because the older you become, the poorer the quality of the sperms and yep. the eggs. Okay. So the earlier you consult, the better it is. All right. Uh, now, now we hear there's different types of infertility, primary, secondary. Just, just explain that for us. Yeah. Yes, there's really two types of infertility. There's primary infertility and then there's secondary infertility. Uh, primary infertility refers to those couples whereby there has been no pregnancy before. Right. And secondary means that these couples might not have a child, but at least there was a pregnancy before. Either it was a miscarriage or abortion or an ectopic pregnancy. So those who were pregnant before are referred to as having secondary infertility. All right. Let's get through to Kathleen. Kathleen, now you, you're from Infertility Awareness Association of South Africa. Now, how much of a problem is infertility in our country? How common is it? Well, it's very common. Um, it's the... Uh, communication about um, creating awareness and still a subject of taboo. People don't talk about it, couples don't talk about it and uh, it's about um, the stigma of um, 
always the woman's fault. Mm -hmm. So it is a problem. It is very challenging. Um, not enough communication is being done about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not only South Africa, it's across Africa as well. Mm. So, so what do you do as IFASA? <clears throat> IFASA was established as a non-profit organization in um, 2013 by a group of females who were facing challenges in terms of fertility problems and challenges. Mm. And it was basically looking at what is being done, what education is out there, how are some of the medical aids assisting patients, what are couples actually talking about? Where can they go? And is time on their side or not? So mm. IFASA looks at educating the general public, couples. Um, it's not only about it's the woman's fault. It's about couples taking the journey together and what options are available mm. um, once you know what your actual status is. Yeah. So, so in your interaction with the communities, I mean, what's, what's the level of knowledge on infertility that you pick up? Well, in the two years going on to three now, it's been anonymous has now changed to I am infertile or I am experiencing issues and challenges. Mm. So the education level has, there's been a change in that. The support from specialists, um, from fertility centers has been a change in that as well. So, and that's only in the two and a half years. So. It's a matter of talking about it now and actually where do we go and get assistance. Um, the month of Feb is known as Reproductive Health Month. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, 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 I mean, essentially, um, you're worried about the level of you know, knowledge amongst communities and, and that's why you're there to increase awareness. It's to increase awareness and it's okay. to empower couples. All right, okay. Let's just hold it there because we need to go for a commercial break. After the break, we'll learn more about infertility, this, this time in men. Please stay with us. And I'm Rebecca Minchetti Miller, S.A.B. Miller, and House of Bush in Bev. It's something that I need to learn to say more often. We'll together produce around a third of the world's beer. It is a mouthful. So have you ever considered skin bleaching? Nigeria tops the list of African countries with 77% of its women bleaching their skin. Now I can see that it is not good because it affects my face and some of my body parts. Thousands of Arab Israelis and Palestinians participated in a big rally. Flight MH17 was shot down by a Russian-made missile. How those chips may fall is a prediction best left to the currency of time. That's Primetime News, Africa Journal, and your world on SABC News. A very good afternoon. You're watching the Midday Report. Lunchtime News Amplified. But for now, this is what they call home. Their hope to shift to a higher ground seems to be against the tide. Midday Report provides you with more than just news stories. I just want Port Elizabeth to know that they own a world-class theatre. Good afternoon, you're with the news at one in the headlines. Very good afternoon to you. This is News Live. I'm Natasha Thorpe. Let's take a quick look at what's coming up in your headlines. Good afternoon and welcome to A View from the House. For all things news, tune in to Midday Report weekdays at 12 noon only on the SABC News Channel. always wanted kids so my wife said you know we need we need to be sure so we just don't keep trying and wondering what's going on we went to see our doctor and he was very surprised so he told my wife to step out for a bit and because he wanted to have a discussion with me so he said have you ever heard of a fertility test so he explained to me what it entails For me, it wasn't a big deal then. I wanted us to have another child. Whatever it would take, let's do it. We went through the fertility test. When I explained that to some of my friends, and they were shocked. 
at me accepting to do that. It's amazing how people find it taboo that the man's responsibility is bounded uh, within the confines of the living room. I think I know only one or two who, who have gladly gone through fertility tests because they wanted to be sure. Many will say, no, that's not my responsibility. And the more you ask, they become very hard on you. They call you names and I've been called names. Fertility is a shared responsibility, whether we like it or not. If you claim that you want a family, you cannot say that fertility remains the responsibility of the woman. In this day and age, that should not be an embarrassing uh, situation. It is a shared responsibility. It is you doing things together. So you learn to share other things because you have that very personal, very scary. It is scary. Um, is it embarrassing? Of course it is. I mean. It's not easy for somebody to say, I can't bear children. But can you accept it? You should. Because it's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no harm, there's no shame to that at all. Uh, will this change? I think it will change if more men start talking. Many men think they go through these things alone and they find it very scary to come out in the open and say, you know what, I do things that are not ordinarily what men would thump their, their chest and say that's a man's job. Welcome back. Men obviously do have problems with infertility. Now to understand more about causes and risk factors of infertility in, in men, we still have our special guest, Dr. Jack Biko, based at the Steve Biko Academic Hospital in Pretoria. And we also have Kathleen uh, Rushta-Smith from IFASA. Now, Dr. Biko, I mean, uh, infertility, as you described earlier, can affect men. Um, just take us through, I know you started off by telling us about the brain and, and that sort of thing. Just take us through the usual causes or the common causes of infertility in men. And we'll come back and talk about, you know, the stigma, yeah. you know, issue and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. I think as a start, we should understand that infertility is not a problem of a person. It is a problem of a couple. Right. So we see people as couples because yeah. if there's a small problem in a male, like the sperm count is a little bit low, yeah. but the female is fine, then the female will compensate with that low sperm count. Then there's going to be no problem. Right. So it is when there's a small problem in the male and a small problem in the female or a big problem in any one of the two that we've got a problem. Yeah. Right. Interesting, so, interesting, because obviously we, we started off and, and we're saying here we're talking about infertility in men. But in fact, it's infertility in, in this couple, couple yeah. looking at the small problems <laughs> Absolutely. that may be there in men. Absolutely. Great. So the main factors that contribute to infertility yeah. obviously would be like we said before, any problems in the brain, if you have TB in the brain, a tumor in the brain, will affect the signals that have to go to the testicles to, pr to produce the sperms. The bigger problem is the problems within the testicles themselves. You know, injury to the testicles, infections, you know, yeah. mumps, infection. As a child, you get infections, mumps, and you get swelling in the testicles, and then the t testicles start to fail to produce sperms. Mm and also accidents, bicycle accidents, car accidents that damages the pipes and previous surgery, pelvic surgery, especially like hernia surgery, they can damage the pipes of the, of the testicles, mm. that leading to infertility. There are other problems as well, <coughs> congenital problems, whereby instead of ejaculating forward, yeah. the sperms actually go into the bladder. Okay. So when the man urinates, the sperms is in the urine. Right. So that's why various tests have to be done. If they say there's no sperms, we must check is it indeed no sperms? Mm. Or are they in the bladder or are they, are they somewhere else? Mm. Or are they stuck in the testicles they just can't come out? Yeah. Interesting <coughs> that you mentioned, obviously, that this is a couple's problem. Yeah. You run a fertility clinic at Steve, Steve Biko Academic Hospital. Now, from your experience, do you, do you see only the females 
or do they come to you as couples or do you insist that they come to you as couples? No, we insist that they come to us as couples because once you don't do that, you're going to create blame in the family. Right. This is going to say, it's not my problem, it's your problem. She's going to say, it's not my problem, it's your problem. That's why we don't like this concept of male or female infertility. We prefer right. to stick to couple. Because right. then they must understand it's, their pro it's, a, it's, a, it's a couple problem. Right. They have to work together to resolve the issues here. And they can be helped. There is no problem that cannot be resolved right. in 2016. Right, right. Very, well, that's a very positive statement to make. Now, if you're looking at <coughs> male causes of infertility versus female causes of infertility, what are we talking about? What sort of, what percentage of the problems do they constitute, as it were? I'm afraid I have to surprise you here, but the males alone might contribute up to 40% of causes. Really? So it's extremely high, and unfortunately the guys don't believe that. Yeah. They don't agree with that, and the families don't agree with that, and the ladies don't even believe that. They think they carry all the problems. But it's a significant increase in male infertility. Whether well, it's a lifestyle issue, smoking and drinking, that affect that, but there are many factors involved. So male Infertility is a major, major cause. Did you just say that it's, in, it's increasing? It is increasing. Really? And, and, and obviously we're thinking it could be, you know... It's a lot of lifestyle issues, factors. Yeah. Lifestyle yeah. factors, environmental <coughs> factors, delayed treatment for infections, uh, trauma, sports yeah. trauma, stuff like that. Yeah. It's a lot of factors. And then congenital problems. There are certain problems that we are born with mm. that we only pick up later in life. So it's a major problem. Male factors is really a major problem yeah. that is not spoken about. Yeah. Kathleen, here's a problem. I mean, we just heard now about the fact that this is an increasing problem that at least male factors in infertility is an increasing problem. Mm -hmm. And in communities out there, you know, there's this notion that men don't have problems. Mm -hmm. What do you encounter? Well, in terms of the education platforms which we use, um, your social media, newsletters, IFASA website, um, interacting with people in the community, um, whether it's from starting with anonymous to actually um, which centre could we go to, which clinic could we go to. And definitely from uh, male encounters, it's a matter of women are at fault, it's a matter of mm. Um, you've done something wrong or you've been bewitched or all kinds of cultural, cultural issues come into play and um, traditions as well. Mm. So we find it very difficult when you, you're talking to women and you're talking to men separately. Mm. And exactly what doctor's been saying is um, you've got to have it as a couple's um, journey together. Yeah. Um, so so you, you counsel couples or do you just talk to communities in general? How, how do you do it? It's a matter of um, we, we try and get communities together yeah. in terms of educational campaigns. Right. To give an example, in November was endometriosis month. Mm. So it was about whether you had fertile or infertile challenges, yeah. whether you were diagnosed, whether you are looking or you are on treatment. How can we get together and how can we talk about it? So yeah. we had an endometriosis evening yeah. where we had specialists to actually talk to communities and we still have the challenge of not everybody would actually physically come out yeah. but they would communicate through our newsletter our Facebook our social media platforms yeah, but lastly uh, is, is, is the issue you know the attitudes in communities especially, especially in so far as males are concerned is that changing it's changing in the sense that um, and we've, we're changing in the sense that men are, are asking more questions mm -hmm. Um, in the sense of uh, medical questions, yeah. as in, um, okay, we're now um, on a journey, we, we know that we have to be assessed. Um, so men's perceptions are changing, and specifically we're finding that more in your Indian community um, in terms of men. Mm. Unfortunately, in our African community, mm. men are still seen to be right. not going to talk about it. Okay, well, after the break, we'll learn more about infertility, issues that affect females. Please stay with us. Are you the person we're searching for? The guy who 
steps up, way, way up, the queen of the pop and lock, and whatever this is, the party train conductor, all aboard, the answer is yes, you are that guy, and we salute you, party comrade, join the movement online. The big news is Newsroom. We also stream live on YouTube. Whether you're at home, at the office or at the gym, wherever you are, Newsroom is right there with you. Bringing you all the latest news, updates, sports, weather and everything in between. Get all the latest news you need on the go via live streaming on our YouTube channel. That's Newsroom, weekdays at 9am, only on the SABC News Channel. A romantic adventure film starring Ivan Boeta and Donnelly Roberts. The story begins in the beautiful vineyards of Paul in the Western Cape. The adventure takes off when the characters find themselves on the tropical island of love, Mauritius. Josephine's work is more interesting and distinguishable. She visits war stricken zone countries to tell the story of the damage war often leaves behind. This particular exhibition's case places that are named after conflict or disaster or war or reconciliation. And basically what it is, is is it's a collection of the best animated short films from around the world this year and the idea is to inspire uh, animators and directors with this exciting content and so that's been offered to us as a cinema and uh, we're very excited to, to be screening the animated show of shows here in South Africa. Join Rufula Mula for that one hour weekly dose of arts and entertainment news every Friday at 9 p.m. on Trends. In an African uh, culture, people get married with, within a year. There's a lot of pressure from, from family, from friends, because they're expecting children immediately. It's sad when we talk about infertility, we always put the blame on the woman. It is a shared responsibility. We need to encourage couples to talk about infertility issues. I had pains in, in my lower stomach. The doctor who was trying to do all kind of tests on me was suspecting maybe I have cancer of the cervix. I'm happy because it was negative, so there are no signs of, of cancer. But meanwhile, the pain kept on going on and on. They found out that my, my tubes had blocked for some time and because they were not treated on time. had to undergo a surgery. Once you remove your fallopian tubes as a woman, that's a, uh, you know, a hope that you, you're holding on to, to conceive uh, naturally. It was very difficult for me and uh, very difficult for my husband too. But I thank, I thank my husband then because he stood, he stood by me. At some point, he was like, you know, we have to find a permanent solution. Several visits to, to my doctor and my doctor was like, you know, the only permanent solution is to go through hysterectomy. That means all your hopes of getting a baby are done. Welcome back. So let's understand a little more about those causes and risk factors for infertility insofar as female factors are concerned. And let's, start, let's be back with you, Dr. Biko. We told that infections, or at least there's differences between, you know, causes and risk factors for infertility in developing versus developed countries. Your comment? Yeah, in developing countries, you've got a high burden of infections. And these infections can then infect the tubes. And the tubes are very narrow structures. If they swell up, they get blocked. If they swell up again, they get blocked again, and then they close completely. Mm. So in the developing world, uh, tubal infertility, blocked tubes, is a major problem. In the developed world, it's more ovulatory problems. Eggs don't come out. You know, they've got eggs, but they just don't grow. So it's like polycystic ovary syndrome. Yeah. And I think we should not underestimate the effect of age all over the world. Age. Women these days are educated. They go to school. They have to go do their postgraduate studies. Mm. They're getting older. 
they work for themselves, they forget to make children early on, and then when they wake up, they're 35 years, 40 years old, and then they remember, oh, I forgot to make a child. <laughs> so age-related infertility is a major problem. We see a lot of ladies above the age of 35 yeah. who want to conceive. But what, what actually <laughs> happens with age? The problem is that uh, women are born with their eggs. They don't form new eggs. Men form new sperms every three months. So men can father a child up to the age of 90, 100. But women, as you get older, the quality and the quantity of the eggs decline. That's why they reach menopause, because they've run out of eggs. Mm. So that's a problem. By the time we reach 35 and above, we've got fewer eggs, and the quality of those eggs is not as good as it was in your late 20s, in the early 30s. Yeah. Okay. So, so essentially, I mean, just back on the infections story, uh, I mean, this is a major cause of infertility in the developing countries. And, and essentially, this is really preventable. Yeah. With, obviously, treatment. Now, let's go back again to the ovaries. Now, you mentioned something that goes wrong with the ovaries, other than the fact that, you know, there's fewer eggs with age. But are there common conditions that affect the ovary that can lead to problems with egg production? Look, the most common problem of the ovary that causes infertility is your polycystic ovary syndrome. Yeah. It affects one in ten women. So okay. if you see ten women, one of them has got PCOS. Yeah. It's a major, major problem. It is not difficult to manage. It is manageable but not treatable. So those patients right. have to see a fertility specialist, yeah. not just a gynecologist or a general a GP, but a fertility specialist. Yeah. Because their treatment is very specific, because if you over-treat them, you can kill these patients. Yeah. If you under-treat them, they will not fall pregnant. Is there a way that they can, you know, develop symptoms earlier and, yeah. you know, that no, it can be picked up earlier? The symptoms of polycystic ovary syndrome that patients will present with is irregular periods. Yeah. If your periods are irregular, then you have to see your gynecologist, because they must check your hormones, because the other symptoms they will not know. Yeah. So it's mainly irregular period. Sometimes you can have facial hair. Yeah. And that also should worry women with facial hair and right. with skin problems that they might have a, a hormonal problem. Okay. And then let's get into the womb. Problems there that can cause infertility? Well, the problems in the womb that can cause infertility, in our setup, in African patients in particular, it's your uh, fibroid uterus, multifibroid uterus. We know that one in three women, one in three African women, will have a fibroid. But not all fibroids are problematic. It is those fibroids that sit in the cavity of the uterus mm. that causes infertility. And the infertility, infertility there is not caused by lack of the egg and the sperm coming together. They come together, the baby is made, and the baby moves into the womb, but when it gets there, there's a fibroid sitting where the baby should be, mm. and the baby gets kicked out. You get a miscarriage very, very early on, yeah. before you even know that you're pregnant. Okay. So fibroid is a major problem in the uterus itself. Okay. Anything of, uh, affecting the lining of the womb? Perhaps that, that well, infections, and a lot of patients go to the doctors for womb scrubbing. Mm. Now, womb scrubbing is particularly bad because it causes scars in the womb. And those scars, you struggle to follow. Because if it's a scar, the baby cannot grow in a scarified uterus because there's no blood flow from the mother to the womb. So mm -hmm. you can't feed the baby. So womb scrubbing is a major problem causing damage to the lining of the womb. Talk about the lining of the womb. Kathleen, you have a personal story about yourself. Yes. Please tell us. Well, um, also um, at the age of 22, 23, um, didn't know if there was anything wrong in terms of menstrual cycles or anything like that. And at that time, there wasn't anyone to talk to. I mean, infertility or fertility challenges, there weren't any avenues. And it was some um, symptoms of um, no regular menstrual cycle or very painful, um, looking at all issues in terms of upbringing in your community. And eventually, just through a GP, um, I think it was only the start of um, fertility challenges and um, uh, cancer, ovarian cancer, so it was a matter of try to conceive, um, couldn't, and the Medfem Clinic was the first, um, I think, fertility specialist that became known in South Africa, and I was diagnosed with endometriosis. I made the decision um, not to follow any other um, options in terms of conceiving or treatment, and it was a decision I made. Um, 
but it's about Ifasa's education is also about informing couples and women um, out there about what's available and the decision that you make and that you live with but it doesn't necessarily have to be that um, uh, okay. whether it's conceiving or not. Dr. Biko, what, what is endometriosis and how common is it? The womb inside the girdle lining is called the endometrium. Now every month the womb prepares for a pregnancy and that lining grows. So if the, the lady doesn't fall pregnant, that lining is shed. Shedding that lining is called menstruation. Now the presence of that lining inside the body but outside the uterus is called endometriosis, which means that if you've got that lining, let's say on your tubes, on your intestines, then every month that lining grows. You bleed internally every month when you menstruate outside. Yeah. Okay. So, the so, so the assumption is that if it occurs anywhere outside the womb, in the womb it doesn't basically renew itself. No, it does. Re it's supposed to renew itself every month within the womb. Yeah. And the metrosis is when it happens in the womb and outside the womb. Okay. So it happens in both places. Yeah. It causes significant problems because it basically makes the womb lining uncomfortable for a pregnancy. Right. It impairs the movement of the sperms and the metrosis. Yeah. It can block your tubes and gives you severe period pains, give them pain during intercourse, and they often have chronic pelvic pain. Very quickly, how common is it? It's a very common, amongst the infertile couples, probably about 20 to 30 percent of the infertile couple will have endometriosis. Very well. All right. Let's hold it there because we need to go for a quick break. When we return, more on how to manage infertility. Please stay with us. Contralesa is actually stirring the port here. I'm sure they've been consulted as Contralesa. They did not see a snake. Now that in certain areas uh, <laughs> there, there are certain benefits that might possibly be accruing, there is a snake, now we need to reverse the process. I agree, but it is not above the sovereignty of the people. The very same court you're talking about. The sovereignty of the people, are, you probably should explain that to me. But the sovereignty of the people is above everything. It is not proper the way facts are presented to the public. Are you in contact with Jose Hulu Machudi? He was uh, kicked out by the court because he wanted to be Amikas Kura. For your weekly dose of all things legal, join Dumila Mateza every Sunday at 2 p.m. only on SABC News Channel. News Today takes an in-depth look on news locally, continentally and globally. We bring the world to your home. We cover all economy news extensively to keep you informed. We are live to break news as and when they happen across the world. We analyze news using experts in all aspects. Make a date with News Today every Monday to Friday from 3 to 5.30 p.m. there was only the incurable. Now, there is hope. Our procedures and techniques have contributed to there being a bit more laughter in the world. The right kind of laughter. Allow us to explain how we can bring that laughter into your world. IVF or in vitro fertilization and ET or embryo transfer are techniques which are used for a variety of infertility problems, particularly for male factor problems, endometriosis, advanced maternal age or when the female partner has blocked or damaged fallopian tubes. There are five stages in the procedure. Medication, monitoring, egg retrieval, laboratory and waiting stage. First, the medication stage. 
two types of medication are used during this stage. The function of these injections is to stimulate the ovaries to develop multiple follicles. We now move on to the monitoring stage. After five days of hormone injections, ultrasound scans are performed to determine the number of follicles and their size. Not all follicles contain eggs and the size of the follicle determines the maturity of the eggs. An ovulation injection, overdrill, is usually given at a specific time in the evening. Egg retrieval will then take place 36 hours after the ovulation injection, this being a good 8 hours before the egg is due to be released from the ovary. The third stage, or egg retrieval stage, lasts only 15 to 20 minutes and is performed while the patient is under sedation. The follicular fluid in which the egg is suspended is methodically drained into a test tube and this is done with each follicle. The fourth stage is the laboratory stage. A laboratory scientist using a high-powered microscope identifies the eggs immersed in the follicular fluid. The eggs are then placed into a dish which contains a highly specialized growth medium. The medium allows the eggs and later embryos to continue developing as they would in the fallopian tubes. The sperm sample is collected, prepared and placed in the medium with the eggs. The dish with eggs and sperm are placed in an incubator and fertilization then occurs naturally. The embryo transfer is performed three to five days after aspiration. Our laboratory scientists who have been monitoring embryo development closely will know which embryos to replace into the uterus. Your doctor will discuss with you which and how many of the embryos are to be replaced at this stage. A more accurate estimation of the success rate for the treatment will also be covered. The embryo transfer is a minor procedure requiring no sedation. Finally, we enter the waiting stage. Extra medication is given to maintain a healthy lining. Emotionally, this can be a very taxing time. Hormone levels are high and there is not much which can be done to influence the outcome of the treatment. Whether there is a pregnancy is determined soon after the embryo transfer and the patient is advised to resume normal activities in this period. The pregnancy test is done two weeks after the embryo transfer. Welcome back. So there's obviously hope then for couples that have a problem of infertility. To understand what options are available, we still have our guests, Dr. Jack Biko, gynecologist and reproductive medicine specialist based at the Steve Biko Academic Hospital in Pretoria, um, Kathleen uh, Smith from EFASA. Dr. Biko, perhaps before we talk about managing infertility, and I know that we've covered this before, let's, let's just remind ourselves about how we can prevent the problem of infertility in the first place? Well, firstly, have your children early. Yeah. Don't wait until they're 30, 40 for the struggle. Secondly, don't ignore those infections. Those vaginal infections treat them. Because the commonest causes of the blocked tube is those infections which are not very painful. They are a little bit painful. Don't ignore them. Because the ladies will go for treatment only for those severe painful uh, infections. Problem ones are those subclinical ones with a little bit of discomfort here. See your doctor, prevent yeah, those infections. Well, that, that's the point. Then how, how, how can you know, people watching this program know that as a young female, I possibly might have an infection? What should they look out for? Firstly, prevent the infection by using condoms, yeah. sticking with one partner. Yeah. If you're together with one partner, you're unlikely to get any infection. Right. But if you do have abdominal symptoms, the discharge, which doesn't smell well or it's itchy, consult your GP. Okay. Right. So, so treat those infections, have babies alien Absolutely, and so yeah. on. All right. And, and the men? <clears throat> Same thing to the men. Yeah. If the woman gets treatment, the men must get treatment as well because right. otherwise it's going to be continuous reinfection okay. of the couple. So they must both get treatment. All right. Okay. Here's this couple then, young couple, um, have a, has a problem of infertility. How do you go about, you know, helping the couple? We first have to make investigations. Right. We have to find the cause. We can't treat and guess, let's try this, let's try this. We okay. have to do the investigations. Right. And when do you start? In the male, we want to take the sperms. 
we have to investigate the sperms. We want to see how many sperms do we have, what is the number of sperms, and we check the movement of those sperms. Do they move? And then we check what we call the progressive movement. Because sometimes sperms move, but they move in circles. So we want to look for progressive forward movement. We have to check that. And then look at the morphology. So you might have millions of sperms, but if they're all abnormally shaped, then they won't work. So the shape of the sperms must be looked at. Okay. So, so there's this notion that men are very simple uh, creatures and women are a lot, a, a lot more complicated. So you're saying that in men you only do one test, you just check the sperm. We check the sperms, we're going to do the other test only if there's a problem with the sperms. Right. Yeah. Okay. There are other blood tests that we have to do in both couples, like HIV, because not that we don't treat you if you're HIV positive, but if you're HIV positive, we have to optimize the couple before we make them pregnant. Make sure that we don't transfer the infection from the mother to the child. Yeah. So we have and to do HIV test. Okay. In the, in the females? Sorry, sorry to hurry up. But yeah. In the females, we have to obviously uh, make sure that they do ovulate every month. Yeah. And then we have to check the tubes, see if they're open or closed. All right, and then we have to investigate, look, the womb is fine. There's no fibroids in the cavity of the uterus. Okay. So what are the common options, now, treatment options, that you normally you know, make available to couples? Well, options we have is simple from time to intercourse. There's a specific period in the, in the cycle that the woman can fall pregnant. It's a very short window. Mm -hmm. So we teach patients about that window. So you should have intercourse around this time. Because the rest, you will not fall pregnant. If that doesn't work, we can then do what we call artificial insemination in some couples, whereby the sperm of the male is taken, we wash it and prepare it, and we inject the sperms into the womb of the patient. It's not expensive, it's pretty much cheap and easy to do by most doctors. And the more advanced technique should be IVF in vitro and ICSI. Yeah. Intracytoplasmic intra sperm injection. All right, make that simple for us. Let's start with intra, in, what? IVF. IVF. Yeah. In uh, vitro fertilization. Yeah. Yeah. IVF simply refers to patients getting injections. Yeah. We harvest their eggs, yeah. whether it's 5, 10, or 15 eggs. Yeah. And then we get the male partner sperms. And then we culture them together, the sperms and the eggs together. Outside the body. Outside the body. Right. And then the sperm, it's a natural process. Because the sperms are just put together with the eggs naturally outside, and the sperms will fertilize the eggs. And then a day later, we have a look and see how many eggs have been fertilized. And then two, three days later, or five days later, we'll take one or two of the fertilized eggs, the babies, we we'll put them in the womb. Mm. That's IVF. Okay. You obviously deal a lot with couples that have a problem with infertility. You counsel them. And how do you give support to those that, or perhaps how do you approach treatment options in the couples that you counsel on a daily basis? Well, once couples have been to a fertility specialist and they've been assessed in terms of um, fast tracking their fertility challenges, um, it's a matter of going through the various treatment options, um, looking at what's being covered through the medical aid. Um, but it's different options, whether and it's to be informed and to be empowered to make the decisions they choose, whether it be IVF, whether it be adoption, whether it be something silly or small that could be resolved just by understanding and knowing what their status is. Mm -hmm. Dr. Because you mentioned medical aid, what is the cost of these various procedures? Uh, I mean, you know, I know that you know public institutions, but I mean, there's obviously private fertility clinics. What is the cost involved in all of these things? Well, in the public sector, you're looking at around, it's expensive. IVF is expensive. In the public sense, you're looking between fifteen and 30000 because it's subsidized by the state. In the private sector, it's much more expensive. It's going to be above between thirty five and 95000 because mm. it's unsubsidized. And this is the, the total? The total cost, the medication, the, the procedures, and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And you encounter this, the, the, the problem around cost? Yes, um, yeah. that is why for the month of February, being Reproductive Health Month, IFASA has um, been promoting and educating the public in terms of certain clinics that we have partnered with um, to get a 25% discount on their first assessment in terms of the cost, um, to be able to assess where they are, what kind of treatment would they need, and um, which medical aids actually do cover the treatment, mm. and to be informed um, specifically in terms of the prescribed medication benefits as well. Well, I mean, I guess to avoid the issue around, you know, the high cost and the trauma, traumatic, you know, uh, issue facing 
couples with infertility, it would make sense to prevent it in the first place. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we had for Dr. Steve Biko, <coughs> uh, gynecologist and reproductive medicine specialist from uh, Steve Biko Academic Hospital. Thank you very much for contributing to our show. Thank you, sir. Right, and Kathleen Rujda Smith from IFASA, Infertility Awareness Association of South Africa. Thank you so much for sharing your personal story with us in the first place and uh, uh, contributing to the show and, uh, and of course continue the good work out there. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, folks. Unfortunately, that's it for today. That's how we come to the end of our show. You can join us again next week on SABC News. And, and please show those views and comments with us via our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. And of course, you can tweet at Twitter as SABC Health Talk. And by the way, if you want to watch a repeat of this show and all of our previous shows, simply go to the SABC YouTube or simply just Google SABC Health Talk Infertility and this show will pop up on your screen. I'm Dr. Selomu Thank you very much for watching Health Talk and please do take care.